Repentance is the turning of the heart. Something happens in the heart. A man's heart turns, right? But that turning doesn't happen because you want, because you want to turn. Even that turning happens because God gets in there and makes that turning happen. You are my hiding place You always fill my heart with song Of deliverance Whenever I am afraid I will try Luke 19, 11 to 27. Now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called ten of his servants and delivered to them ten pounds and said to them, do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Master, your pound has earned ten pounds. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you are faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. And the second came saying, Master, your pound has earned five pounds. Likewise, he said to him, you also be over five cities. Then another came saying, Master, here is your pound, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief, for I feared you because you are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you put my money in, uh, did you not put my money in the bank that at my coming I might uh, have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, take the pound from him and give it to him who has ten pounds. But they said to him, Master, he has ten pounds. For I say to you that to everyone who has will be given, and from him who does not have, 
Even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. We've been teaching on the subject of material prosperity and what the Bible has to say about it. We began with Genesis chapter 1, if you remember. We began with how God created all material things for man and then finally made man and put him in a world of abundance of material supply and called it very good. He said that state and condition in which man was placed in was a very good thing, he said. Now, like I always say again and again, a lot of people think it's bad, but God says it's very good. God established a paradigm by doing that. He set it as a model that man's life must be lived this way. This is what God's will is. This is what God desires, that there must be an abundance of material resources and man must not be, must not be living in poverty, wanting uh, in, in any way. He must live in abundance. That is God's will. And I also pointed out to you from the first chapter itself that God gave man three essential rights. You may call it birth rights. Found in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. When God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness and let them have dominion. He gave man, first of all, dominion. Dominion means except God and his throne, man was placed over all of God's creation. This was given to man, dominion. This is man's birthright. Every human being was created in that way, having dominion. Secondly, when God said, let's make man in our image, he gave man dignity. Dignity. You cannot have any more dignity than this, that you are made in the image and likeness of God. That's the highest dignity a man could have. You and I are made in the image and likeness of God. Dignity is given to us. Thirdly, God has given us delight. That is also found in Genesis 1, verse 26, and in other portions in chapter 1 and chapter 2, where God said, let's make man in our image and likeness, let them have dominion. That dominion did not only mean a rule over, every cre over all creation, but it also gave man the right to enjoy all of creation. Creation was made in such a way that it can bring delight to man, that man can enjoy what God has made. And we were made in such a way that we can derive enjoyment from the created things. Now, these are things that must be told to Christian people, you know, because Christian people have become holier than God, I think. You know, they think enjoying anything is bad, you know. God has made everything for our enjoyment and he has made us with the capacity to enjoy everything that he has made. You know, so dominion, dignity, and delight, three basic birthrights given to man, inalienable rights. Nobody can take it away from him. It belongs to man by divine right God has given. Dominion over everything, dignity, and delight. So prosperity, I said, material prosperity, Material abundance, having much more than enough, helps man to enjoy that dominion, dignity and delight. That's the whole point. I think you must memorize this completely. Why prosperity, why material prosperity is good in the sight of God? Because God didn't make man to be some kind of a slave, you know. He had given him dominion, dignity and delight. And dominion, dignity, and delight is not possible without material prosperity. He cannot have dominion, dignity, and delight being a beggar. He cannot enjoy dominion, dignity, and delight being poor. It is not possible. Because material prosperity enables man to enjoy these three God-given blessings to man, God thinks it's good because it makes dominion, dignity, and delight possible. Now, that's a statement I have to make every time, because after you hear this teaching, you should not say, I didn't know that, you know. 
So this is the most important thing. <laughs> and then the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament, you will find the picture of dominion, dignity and delight everywhere. When we brought them out of the, out of the uh, slavery of Egypt, God brings them to dominion, dignity and delight. That is why a land flowing with milk and honey. Why a land flowing with milk, milk and honey? Why? You know, because dominion is important to God. Without it, man cannot be man. Dignity is important to God. Without man living in dignity, man cannot be man in the image and likeness of God. Delight is important to God. And without that, man cannot be man who is made in the image and likeness of God. Man cannot be man if he cannot have dominion, dignity and delight. He'll be less than a man. How many of you get what I'm talking about? This is serious business. Now, they say when you come to the New Testament, the vision of God changes, they say. A lot of people say, when you come to the New Testament, brother, the Old Testament is different. The New Testament is a whole different story. In the, Old Test in the New Testament, poverty is glorified. Because Jesus said, you leave everything, sell everything, give to the poor and come and follow me. You know, anytime anybody wants to say anything against prosperity, they say, Bible says, sell everything, give to the poor, and then come and follow me. I asked one preacher, did you sell everything? Have you sold everything? Then don't talk to me if you haven't sold everything and given it to the poor. Don't simply be talking against prosperity and saying, sell everything, give to the poor, and come and follow me. You haven't sold anything. Then how can you follow Christ? Huh? Yeah, Jesus said, sell everything, give to the poor and come and follow me. But the thing is, he said it only to a few people. A few people had to do it. Many people never sold anything, never gave everything to the poor and then came and followed him. No, they came as they were and they received him as their master and Lord and they followed him and they gave their life to him. There were followers of Jesus, many women who were wealthy, who ministered to him through their wealth, the Bible says. People like uh, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a rich man, who buried him in a cemetery. He was a rich man. They were all followers of Christ. They didn't go sell everything, give everything to the poor. So there's a, there's, there's a, the total picture must be looked at to understand the whole issue. Now a lot of people say, well, there's a lot of condemnation of riches and the rich in the Bible both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Well, the condemnation of uh, riches is because the riches are abused and used in the wrong way. The book of Deuteronomy is full of economic laws as to how to give, uh, lend money, how to forgive debts, how to give back the property that is lost, how to lend, borrow, how to administer monetary help to the poor, how to treat your brother, how not to take unjust interest, all of these full of economic laws. People who think the Bible has nothing to do with economics, you know, they haven't read the Bible as far as I'm concerned. Bible is full of economics and Deuteronomy is full of it. In the Gospels, Luke is full of it in the New Testament. Actually, Luke, in the whole of Bible, Luke is the, is the Gospel. Luke is the book where you will find a lot about economic life. And Jesus is speaking about it. And so uh, various uh, Bible teachers have said, have calculated it verse by verse, literally, and compared it with other topics that Jesus covers. And they said, Jesus speaks more about money than anything else. Why does he speak more about money than anything else? Why money is so important? You know, this, this is irritation to so many people. One fellow said, why is Jesus is also like Sam Chaladari preaching about money? You know. Why is Jesus talking about money? Why money is so important? Because money, the thinking about money, the use of money, uh, all of that is a mirror into the spiritual life of a person. That is why Jesus talks about money. While he's talking about money, he's actually talking about spiritual life. Using money is talking about spiritual life. You notice that. See, some people think when we are talking about money, we are talking just about money. No, we are not talking about money. Actually, money is the mirror that reflects what a person is spiritually. 
the way he approaches money and uses money and employs money to do things for him shows whether a man is spiritual or a worldly person what he thinks about money determines what kind of a person is he and more than that some of the parables i have showed you show that how you use money and how you think about money in this world and how you use money faithfully in this world in a godly manner determines what your position will be in eternity in this story also it comes to the guy who took the money that this master gave him and multiplied 1 to 10 the master comes back and gives him 10 cities and says be the lord over it you know he is rewarded eternally now so we've been looking at some parables from the gospel of luke because the gospel of luke is full of economic behavior and economic life and jesus does most of the speaking here and a lot of the parables are concerning economics and so this is one of the most important parables that you'll find in the bible the parable of the pounds as it is called now a lot of people have understood this parable i at least i have you know over all the years of my christian life into many years in preaching life also i saw it only as a parable that is speaking about the second coming of jesus you know uh, i understood that the purpose of this parable is as it says in verse 11 that he was near jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of god would appear immediately he spoke another parable to them that's the way the reason is given the reason for the parable is stated like this by luke what is the reason he says he was very near jerusalem see in all the gospels all gospels have a pattern there is a point at which the whole gospel every gospel matthew mark luke particularly have a turning point where everything turns where he journeys to jerusalem this journey to jerusalem becomes very tense because of the wrong expectations of the people they think he's going to go to jerusalem he is supposed to be the king of the jews he's come to rule as king we've been expecting the messiah he looks like the messiah by what he does the miracles he has done and all the things that have happened looks like the messiah he claims he is the son of god he is going to save us from the roman regime he is going to he is going to become the king of the jews and deliver us from the oppression and they are expecting this to happen so whenever he journeys to jerusalem that creates a tension in the story in the gospels it's a very important turning point so when they when jesus turns to go to jerusalem all hearts are eagerly awaiting something grand to happen that he is going to go do something tremendous show himself up as the messiah take over charge and rule as the king and literally establish the kingdom of god on this earth but jesus says no the literal physical kingdom is not going to happen now i'm going to go to jerusalem but not to take over and to rule literally and physically and establish the kingdom in that way right now i have spoken about the kingdom of god before and i have showed you that the kingdom comes in two different ways one it comes spiritually and it has come already the kingdom of god is in you the bible says but literally and physically it has not come it is going to come when jesus comes back to rule and reign so here it's talking about the literal physical full, uh, coming of the kingdom so he wants to make a point to them because they are expecting something wrong they are expecting the literal physical kingdom to happen any moment because he is going to jerusalem they think this is the moment it's going to happen so he wants to clarify something and tell them look it's not going to happen now i'm going to go to jerusalem not to establish the kingdom literally and physically i'm going to go to jerusalem to die there for the sin of the world and then i'm going to be risen again then i'm going to go back to the father and there is going to be a gap between the time i go back to the father and the time that i come back to establish the kingdom literally and physically on this earth where you will rule and reign with me so he wants them to understand that that great event of the kingdom of god the coming of the kingdom of god literally and physically in the world is not going to happen immediately it is not to be expected now he doesn't want to disappoint them terribly so before he even goes to jerusalem he wants to tell them look Don't be expecting that this is a totally different purpose I'm going to go there to die This is a different uh, thing that's going to happen now 
and after that later on this thing that you are expecting is going to happen that is surely one reason why he gives the parable but we only saw that reason we i only understood this parable for many years as a parable that simply tells us that the coming of the kingdom of god literally and physically is not going to happen so immediately it's going to happen with the second advent second coming of jesus it's going to happen that's all i understood from this but later on only i found out that there is a second purpose if you look closely there is a second purpose both purposes are stated in verse 11 so let's read verse 11 again that's where the parable begins right now as they heard these things now a lot of times when we read it we never understood what this meant you know it's very simple we always paid attention to the rest of the verse he spoke another parable because he was near jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of god would appear immediately so he said and then the parable begins we only read it like that but we always kind of let this first line from verse 11 pass over our head and never really paid much attention to it but that is where the second purpose is embedded it is there as they heard these things heard what these what things what did they hear he just got through the encounter of zacchaeus the story of zacchaeus was just over in the first 10 verses he finishes the story by saying for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost he just gone into zacchaeus's house you know that is a tremendous encounter where he encountered this corrupt official of the government then and this guy truly repents and the repentance that he uh, that he, that he had happening inside his heart was revealed by his economic behavior that is very interesting the fact that zacchaeus had repented was clearly noticeable because now he's saying i'll give four times whatever i took unjustly from anybody and i'll give half my wealth to the poor here he is the way he handles money now is different from the way he used to handle until yesterday he has become a different man something has switched and turned in his heart some change has happened that is what repentance is there is a turning away from things that are bad and evil not right before god here is a jew he knows deuteronomy he knows the laws of the book of deuteronomy the economic laws he knows that he has not followed those laws he knows that he has oppressed the poor he has, he knows that he has unjustly taken money made people poor to enrich himself to enhance his financial standing he knows that he has violated every law in the book of deuteronomy he is the man that the prophets condemn prophets like amos condemn he is sleeping in those beds and lounging in those sofas that amos talks about this is the guy this is the kind of guy but he has never paid attention to it he never repented of it knowing all the scriptures knowing all the things that the old testament said he continued to take the bribes he continued to charge overcharge people with taxes he t- continued to grab as much as he could he was a corrupt fellow on that day something happened see repentance see i've been mentioning some things about, about repentance let me say one additional thing today repentance is the turning of the heart something happens in the heart a man's heart turns right but that turning doesn't happen because you want because you want to turn even that turning happens because god gets in there and makes that turning happen friend oh such a friend and he made my heart his own god himself is with me and i know i'm never alone no all my tomorrows will be better than all my hopes we've got love grace peace and power and joy in the holy ghost we've got love my god is never wrong and he makes time for me we got it blew 
about my chains and set the city free. It's like a river and you'll never run it dry. We got power over fear and death, the past filled up with joy. The Holy Spirit fills me up and I need Him every day. Fire, faith, and confidence in knowing what to say. I gave my heart and know I am to the one who loves me most. We got love, grace, peace, and power, and joy in the Holy Ghost. We got love, my God is never wrong. Yet. He may stand for me. We got grace. It blew apart my chains and set the sinner free. It's like a river and you never run it dry. We got power over fear and death. Spirit fills me up and I need Him every day Fire, faith and confidence in knowing what to say I gave my heart and all I am to the one who loves me most We've got love, grace, peace and power and joy in the Holy Ghost we got love, my God is never wrong, He may stand for me we got grace, it blew apart my chains and set the sinner free it's like a river and you never run it dry We got power over fear and death and hearts filled up with joy Oh, we got love, my God is never wrong yet. He makes stuff for me We got grace, it blew up on my chains and set the sinner free We got peace, it's like a river and you never run it dry We got power over fear and death Filled up with joy Found a friend, oh such a friend And he made my heart and soul God himself is with me And I know I'm never alone I know all my tomorrows Will be better than all my hopes We've got love, grace, peace and power And joy in the Holy Ghost We've got love, grace, peace and power And joy in the Holy Ghost Love, grace, peace, and power, and joy in the Holy Ghost.